to God, worship Him. Every prophet and messenger said the same thing. Moses didn't come and say, worship me. Just imagine the Jewish people now tells us, you know, why don't you worship Moses? Why don't you worship Moses? You would say, why should I? Moses is a creation of God. We don't worship creation, we worship God. Likewise, if anyone comes and says, you know, worship Abraham, worship Adam, worship Solomon, worship Noah, worship David, you would say, are you out of your mind? The same people came to tell people not to worship anything but God. Jesus did the same thing. He said, you know, worship him, the Father, worship him alone, no one else. Thou shalt you serve. O our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy will be done, thy kingdom come forever and forever. Whose will be done? The one in heaven. Not his will, because he was subservient to the will that, who, who sent him. The one who sent him is greater than him. The one who sent is the messenger. God sends a messenger to tell the people. So that is what Islam is all about from the day one, to worship God and none else. So if we were born into a Christian family, you may have inherited this belief, but if you deep down think about it, you will say, there's something went wrong somewhere along this teaching of Christ. People have now somehow incorporated a different teaching that he didn't bring. He didn't say to people, worship me. I am God in any shape or form. He even identified who the true God is in John chapter 17, verse 3. This is one verse Trinitarian Christians wish it wasn't there. And they have no answer for that because it clearly says who the true God is. If you look at the Quran, the Quran says that Prophet Muhammad is, the, is not a new thing in the messenger. Many messengers were before him. And God sends prophets and messengers to the people for one reason only, so that they have no excuse in the day of judgment saying, I didn't know who God is. I didn't know what God wanted from me. So God, at specific times in history, because he's just, he sends them warners telling them why they were created and what they have to do, who they have to worship. And God tells us, we are created to worship God, to thank God, to glorify God, to have the utmost reverence to Him. Because if you think about it, let me give you a very mundane scenario. Very mundane. Imagine now, I was walking past with you and a bus hit me. Not bus, a vehicle hit me. Bleeding almost to death, called the police, ambulance. You were there with me. I needed blood, you gave me blood to save my life because it matched. My kidneys all damaged. You gave one of your kidneys to save me. I'm recovering slowly. Weeks later, I wake up from my coma and I see you sitting there. And the nurse tells me, Do you know what happened exactly? I said, No, and tells the story. You're almost about to die, and you were dying unless that kind lady gave her blood and gave her a kidney to save you. Now, what should be my natural response to you? Should I say get lost, or should I say thank you so much? Should I not be grateful to you? My natural response should be one of gratitude. What you have done, now, I would not be even alive if you haven't done so. So I should be naturally grateful to be given me life again in a way to save me by giving you all of this, giving me all of these things. So my natural response is one of gratitude. God gave me two kidneys, the whole circulatory system and the heart to so pump around the blood and everything else. Gave me life and the food to sustain my life. Should I not be grateful to him? My natural response is one of gratitude. That is what God wants us to to be grateful to him. Worship is not something like you do in, in go in a very um, dark night in the coldest of a pond and immerse, immerse yourself underneath the water 25 times and so that's worship, like some kind of ritual. No. Worshiping God 
it's whatever God is pleased with. If we praise God, if we thank God the way He is appreciates it, that becomes gratitude and worship. And are there other ways to um, do God's will than worship? So in other ways, for example, I believe, or I like to think that uh, anything that gives me joy is something that God has done for me. So in living about my day with joy, that that's also me fulfilling God's will. That also is how you... So how you live your life in terms of your interactions with yourself and the reality around you, that could be other human beings, that could be other creations, it could be the environment. Environment. What you find joy should be something that is good, something that is beneficial, something that is good for everything else. You shouldn't find joy in killing people, robbing people, uprooting unnecessary crops and you know destroying the natural beauty and so on and so forth. If you find joy in these things, we need to think twice about why should it give us joy. But if you're not like that and you say by being charitable, by saying kind words to people, by helping the poor and the needy, the old lady helping her with her shopping. If you find joy in these things, Islam actually says, many of these things are teaching of Islam. By being kind and charitable and merciful, being upright, being just, all of this. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I have not been raised except but to raise the nobility of character. I have not been raised except to raise the nobility of character. That means, look at this Islamic position. You are noble by default. But he came to raise it even further. You might have a little bit of jealousy left here and there. He said, no, there's no point being jealous. Look at the evils of jealousy and look at the benefit of jealousy. You should just stay away from being jealous because the evil outweighs the, ha the, the good that it does. Yeah? So an example I can tell you the Quran says about, they ask you about gambling. Yes, They ask you about gambling and alcohol consumption. Why? And the Quran says, say, in them are some benefit as well as harm. But the harm outweighs the benefit. Look, don't people find joy when they win a lottery? Many people become very joyous, very happy. When people socialize with having alcohol and it removes them from the stress and the anxiety and the depression, but because it somehow gets into another state of mind, people have joy. But the Quran says, even though there might be some benefit that you perceive, the harm outweighs the benefit. So stay away from it. Why are the harms? To give you an example, most of the accident and emergency admissions are done the violent crimes that happens people come to A&E in the hospitals are because of the influence of alcohol in UK for sure so we know the harm there what alcohol does to people it befogs their mind they can't think straight they go come at home and become angry or in the pub in the streets wherever and they are fighting violent become so violent they have domestic violence because of that for various other reasons gambling look what gambling does to people it makes them lazy it makes them not responsible they want free lunch they want easy money they want easy wealth easy resources it puts you like on a couch potato you sit there you think you win the lottery and then you will have all the money that you need what we will do it creates within you greed greed and in fact many of the world's problem is because of greed a country usurps invades another country because of the resources it has oil gas natural resources why do you see the west was happy with you know going invading another country and so on because they have made a deal already we're going to take the pipeline from there to us that's what it is greed greed makes people such that they no longer remain kind to other compassionate to other imagine now you know in, in fact the, the, the idea of usury and interest look what it does even though you might say okay fine, you know what i can get some money and then do some business out of it but if i was in need i ask you for five thousand pounds and you say no give me seven thousand pounds back you're exploiting my weakness because i don't have that money 
and you want extra 2,000 pound on top of it as an interest because you know that I am weak and vulnerable and you're exploiting that situation. That's not kindness. That's not showing empathy or sympathy. That's not showing some kind of, you know, you know, this idea of humanity. You're exploiting, you're an abuser. You're abusing my vulnerability. So many of these things that we see, there might be some perceived benefit, no doubt, but the harm outweighs the benefit. So Islamic principle is stay away from all of that. So Islam says it came to perfect the nobility of character. So if you find joy in helping others, being kind to the others and so on and so forth, this is something that is praiseworthy. This is something that God appreciates. God created you to live in a society in which you live in mutual harmony, mutual tranquility between yourself, tolerance between yourself, even though you might disagree. That's the message of Islam. The Quran says, you know, if you, if you don't want to believe, the consequences are going to be in the hereafter. No one can force a belief on you because belief is a matter of conviction of the heart and the mind and then manifest that in the actions of the limbs. That's what faith is. So if you really believe in God, you would want to show that with your limbs actions. If you love someone, you don't simply just don't do nothing. You express it, what's in your heart. You say, I love you, maybe. You bring some flowers, some presents, and so on. You demonstrate with your actions. And, and, and do you, the believer, or, and if so, how do you explain synchronicity or coincidences, but what I like to think, not incidences? Explain a bit further. So, um, some people may say, oh, it's a coincidence that, that I bumped into this person who needed something I could give them, for example. I like to think of that as a synchronicity where it feels like it was orchestrated by God. So, do you see, do you believe that God orchestrates people meeting each other who can help or other things yes, that should yes, be yes. God constantly guides us. He has not left us, created us like a deist God and says, you do whatever you're going to do. No, God constantly guides us, shows us the guidance, whether we are grateful to Him or ungrateful. God says in the Quran, He guides you, shows you both ways, two ways, good and the bad, whether you're grateful or ungrateful. So imagine now, a person is worshipping an idol in front of meditating in front of an idol and meditating and meditating and a dog comes lifts its hind leg and urinates in the idol the worshipper looks at it becomes so angry my god has been defiled start chasing the dog as he was running on the chasing the dog suddenly realized what am i doing my god couldn't even protect itself from being defiled that moment of reflection was the guidance from god it was a, an obligation on that individual then to take that opportunity and say, do the introspection. Maybe what I was doing is wrong. Maybe what I was believing is wrong. So this wasn't like a coincidence. This is the synchronicity that you're talking about. God is showing them at that point, by this example, that this is not God that you're worshipping. Because the God that you worship is, cannot be defiled by a dog like that. God is the king of the kings. God is the, be the holy one, the almighty. So, throughout our lives, atheists, agnostics, people who be, may not have a correct belief in God, they get this glimpse of guidance from God. They need to utilize it, take the opportunity and say, I need to think, I'm worshipping a God that has become ignorant. A Muslim said, Jesus didn't know the Allah, neither did the Holy Spirit. How can it be? How can God be ignorant? That was the moment of his guidance at that time. Maybe it was planned by God for him to come and meet me, meet you and so on, and have that discussion. And he should have taken him from there and say, let me do some introspection, let me reflect on it. If he did that and he became, he was sincere, God will guide. That is the, the justice of God and the love of God, that if you sincerely seek God, he guides you. In fact, Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said about God, that God said, if you come to God, Walking, he comes to you running. If you take one step, you will take many steps, like 10 steps. If you approach to God, he approaches you even more, you know, in more of a degree. Like if you were 
if you were to, him, he will towards, run to you. Yeah. yeah, imagine you are walking towards God, he will, he will come running towards you. Do you see the metaphor? If you go to meaning, yeah. because if you open your hearts to be guided, God guides you and shows your guidance in manifold guidance because you are someone who wants to see God and the pleasure of God and to connect with God. This is what Islamic teaching is, that you abandon and, and, and you reject by knowing with your conviction all the false deities, but then you connect to God and you love God with all your heart, all your mind, like you've heard what the Christians say. It should be something not out of compulsion. It should be not something out of fear. It should be out of your appreciation. And when you say there is good or bad, I think of expansion and constriction, meaning um, something, anything that's good is something that relaxes me, that just expands, becomes bigger, and anything that's bad is fear, is restricting, and that, that these are just, it's just one force that can either go this way or that way. Have you read the Quran? Because there's an ayah in the Quran which says when God wants to guide someone, he opens their breast to Islam. Opens up their breast, expands their breast to Islam, their chest to Islam. Expand their? Their chest. Their it's chest. like yeah, to Islam, yeah. receiving guidance. And those disbelievers, as if, and if they want this, if they want misguidance, not to be guided, he constricts them as if they were climbing up the sky. What happens when you climb up the high mountains? In a high altitude? Uh, we feel constricted because of high altitude, less oxygen. We can't breathe because of this constriction. This is how we feel. God gives that description, as you know, just describing in the Quran, gives that metaphor, this similitude to understand how God guides and leaves people to misguidance. So I believe that my emotions are what tells me how far off or how close I am to God's will for me. So if I feel really good, like like heart open, etc., then it's a sign that yes, I'm going in the right direction. And if I feel bad, it's just God telling me through my emotions that this isn't the way to go. Okay. Generally speaking, yeah. there's of course some truth in that. But we need to be very careful with this approach, especially when emotions can mislead people. Like you can watch a movie and it emotionally changes to a such a point you become um, discriminatory to a particular group of people or, or some things because of what the film has manipulated in that thing. You know what Hollywood does in their movies? They have a propaganda machine, a team propagandist, they want to manipulate the minds of people and vilify or make villainized people in another community because that's what their war is against them. So if it's the war against the East or the Muslims, through their movies and dramas and the serials, the literature, they will make a bogeyman like this is evil. Look at this terrorist terrorizing the world. And then you do not even realize, you watch a movie and say, ah, if I see someone, you know, a, a woman with a hijab next time, oh, there's a terrorist on the street. That's what it's meant to do. So emotions can mislead people because it's manipulatory, depending on where it's coming from and who controls that. So we need to check our emotions with the guidance of God and see which is acceptable and which is not. Because in the Quran, God talks about warfare and says, you don't like warfare even though people want to come and destroy your nature. So you might, God says, you might dislike something which is good for you and like something which is bad for you, this likeness that you have. So God is saying, he knows what's best. Just because you dislike it, it doesn't mean it's good for you. So those people who see that, oh, I am going to be a passive individual. When people come and overcome, took my country and destroy my family, my people, my community, massacre them whole site, ethnic cleansing, genocide, I'm going to stay there. And God says, fight those who fight you. Remove the oppression. And you say, nah, fighting maybe something that you dislike because you are a person who doesn't want to. But sometimes it may be a necessity. So an illustration is there. Things that our hearts often feel, it may not be the right thing, okay? Because when you are in love, for example, your judgment becomes blind. You, you know these sayings, right? You don't see the fault of another person that you are in love with. 
you don't see the forest at all. Other people tell you, demonstrate to you, you don't watch them, you don't listen to them, you don't. Only later when something happens.